In this video, I will highlight our recent work on optimizing linear combination of unitaries for quantum chemistry Hamiltonians. Now, the motivation of, for this work is really to, to figure out how to do uh, decomposition of the uh, quantum chemistry Hamiltonians into linear combination of unitaries in the best way. Why is this needed? Turns out that um, LCU essentially, in short, uh, helps us to uh, do the quantum simulations of uh, uh, quantum chemistry Hamiltonians for fault-tolerant algorithms. Uh, and uh, one of such uh, simple approaches uh, would be Taylor expansion, where Hamiltonian is uh, decomposed uh, into LCU, and then uh, that is used to apply the Hamiltonian powers uh, instead of an uh, actual propagator here, the exponent, right? So that's one way to use uh, LCU. That's just because quantum computer understands unitaries and uh, it is useful to uh, encode the Hamiltonian, uh, which is not unitary, in terms of uh, unitaries. Uh, more sophisticated approach that also can use LCUs is cubitization. And I'm not gonna go into the details of this uh, sophisticated approach. Uh, rather, I would, uh, dedicate a separate video uh, for this uh, technique. But the idea is that you can have uh, LCU to encode so, such a walker operator depicted here. And uh, that walker operator is unitary. And you can extract its phase and the phase of this walker operator uh, will be related to the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, eigenenergies of the Hamiltonian. So uh, you can uh, get the eigenspectrum uh, by doing that. Now, again, we are not gonna go too much into these algorithms. This is just to motivate uh, why LCU is needed. Now, what makes one linear combination of unitaries better than another? It's actually the cost that uh, uh, one will have if they uh, encode the Hamiltonian as a linear combination of unitaries. And that cost is related to one norm of coefficients, meaning that you sum the absolute values of the coefficients, uh, you don't even need the absolute value here because the coefficients can be all made uh, positive simply by absorbing whatever uh, minus ones they may have into the unitaries that uh, won't change the unitary uh, nature, right? So uh, the idea here is that you sum the coefficients uh, and that's that's essentially uh, forms the cost. And you may wonder why one norm of coefficients is so important. Uh, essentially, you want to lower it. Uh, the simple illustration for that and for how we do linear combination of unitaries actually as a circuit uh, can be depicted like this. So it turns out that what we actually encode is not the Hamiltonian itself, but rather uh, for this case, I decided to pick the for concreteness, a uh, very simple example where Hamiltonian is decomposed into four unitaries, right? And what we can encode as a circuit is the Hamiltonian divided by the one norm of coefficients. Why is this object can be encoded? It's just because this uh, V square coefficients that appear in that object, they sum to one. And why that is important, you will see in a moment, because the reason like uh, why this uh, sum of the coefficients squared these uh, they need to sum to one is because they're coming out of the unitary transformation that we use to uh, prepare the circuit. Okay, so now this uh, circuit consists of essentially uh, multiple ancilla in general, and the number of ancillas that we need uh, is uh, scaling logarithmically with the number of unitaries that we have in the sum. In the, this particular case, we have uh, four unitaries. And that's why we need just two ancillas uh, in this uh, scheme. Now, uh, on top of the control unitaries that you can see here, uh, what we also need is so-called prepare uh, circuit, uh, which is really a unitary transformation of ancilla qubits. Uh, then this part is usually called select. And then we do the uh, prepare again, but uh, conjugated version of it. All right, so now how this all works 
you can see by analyzing the what the function is really uh, along the on the circuit, right? So we start with say wave function that we want to act on by the Hamiltonian, and it's a tensor product with uh, two ancilla in the initial state zero, right? So very simple. And then after we apply this prepare circuit, which is a unitary transformation, and it looks like this. So the first column of this unitary transformation is essentially this numbers V1, V2, V3, V4. And that's what appears when we act on phi zero with this uh, state, because zero zero state is essentially is one and three zeros. It's a vector that when VA acts on it, it becomes a superposition of uh, uh, ancilla states, okay? And then we use select circuit with the controlled unitaries. Uh, every time we use control, then it acts really on the corresponding component of the ancilla uh, and the, the unitary itself acts, of course, on the, on the side. So this phi two function right here becomes like this, right? Where unitaries act on corresponding components uh, that are uh, size really. And uh, then the last step is the prepare circuit again, but with a conjugation, then this uh, column in the A becomes the co uh, becomes a row. And uh, we end up with uh, the phi three, where you have, um, the, you can rewrite phi three essentially as this operator uh, where v1 squared, v2 squared, v3 squared, and v4 squared are multiplied by corresponding unitaries, and everything acts on the psi, really. So now you can see that why we uh, wanted this um, v1, v2, v3, v4, uh, sum to with squares to one, because they are essentially encoded as a part of the unitary, so they cannot sum not to one here. And uh, essentially what we did, we applied a Hamiltonian scale by uh, one norm of the initial coefficients, right, to the psi function. That's what we can encode with this approach. And then the larger the L1 norm is, then the smaller, essentially, uh, the scaling factor is. And so the smaller the scaling factor, then you would need to apply this circuit multiple times uh, and uh, essentially that uh, increases the cost. Now, of course, there is this extra uh, components of uh, what uh, other ancillary states could be. And the uh, assumption here is that uh, this will uh, generate what we want if we uh, have ancillary components zero, zero, right? But there are, of course, ways to increase the probability of uh, this component to appear at the end by uh, various methods that I'm not gonna go into. Uh, which is uh, like one of them is uh, oblivious uh, amplitude amplification. So essentially this works and the L1 norm of the coefficients become a crucial uh, factor that uh, you would like to reduce in order for this scheme to work efficiently. Okay, now qu quantum chemistry Hamiltonians that we're interested in, uh, just a quick reminder, we start with a fermionic uh, second quantized form one electron, two electron components. Uh, they, we obtain them from the electronic structure codes. And we usually use uh, fermionic qubit mapping, like Jordan Wigner, for example. Here is just for the sake of defining an annotation that we're going to be using X, Y, uh, Z for the uh, Pauli operators with the subscripts corresponding to uh, qubits, essentially. And then uh, doing this Jordan Wigner transformation, we can obtain isospectral uh, form of the electronic Hamiltonian qubit space. It's a linear combination of Pauli products. The sigmas X, Y, Z is essentially for corresponding uh, qubits. All right. And then uh, what will be useful uh, in the whole discussion here is the decomposition of the Hamiltonian into exactly solvable uh, parts using the Hartree-Fock method. And in order to define this exactly solvable parts, uh, one can uh, recall that, uh, okay, in the electronic structure theory, second quantized form, we can uh, essentially solve any Hermitian one electron Hamiltonian. We can solve them by transforming using orbital rotations, uh, such operators into linear combination of uh, occupation number operators that using the 
uh, German Wigner mapping will uh, essentially be translated to uh, Z operators. Okay, now uh, how to generalize this uh, from one electron to uh, two electron operators? It's actually quite easy. And uh, one just can substitute the one electron sort of uh, central part uh, of this expression by now uh, quadratic form where we have lambda PQ as a matrix and NP and Qs are occupation number operators, right? And again, we sandwich that with orbital rotations and orbital rotations don't change the uh, two-body nature of this uh, operator. So generally, this will result into a sum of one electron and two electron terms. And this is uh, kind of one of the most general forms for uh, solvable uh, by hart fock method uh, two electron Hamiltonians. We'll be using such fragments uh, in decomposition and for LCU as well. I'll explain in a moment how to do that. All right, now, but first let me outline uh, what are the main parts of this work uh, are. And the first, uh, we will start with uh, essentially discussing how uh, one can, uh, how far one can reduce the LCU1 norm. What's the lower bound, absolutely lower bound for uh, this decomposition, uh, because that's useful to, to know so that uh, we can uh, see what uh, we can only go up to in the reduction of LCU1 norm. Then we will see how one can change the Hamiltonian uh, in order to lower the lower bound. Otherwise, uh, you sort of have a lower bound that uh, you cannot go lower than. And then the third uh, item will be optimizing LCU by uh, selecting uh, unitaries that make sure that the one norm is uh, lower than uh, some naive uh, LCU expansion like linear combination of Pauli's, for example. All right, let's see how low one norm actually can be. In order to see that, one can just simply uh, first uh, eliminate the identity from the Hamiltonian if, the, if identity is present, right? Because uh, identity is not an interesting operator yet. Uh, it's a unitary, and so potentially it can increase uh, one norm if, if it uh, is present in the Hamiltonian, but it's no uh, there is no necessity to uh, include identity because we uh, are interested in this propagator and uh, identity is just uh, commutes with the rest and can be removed uh, without uh, changing the, the propagator, right? Now, if we focus now on the uh, Hamiltonian part that uh, has no identity element or shifted essentially, we can try to optimize this shift so that the norm of this uh, uh, part is the lowest. Why do we need the lowest norm? It's just because uh, the rest of the of the Hamiltonian it's uh, it's essentially is subject to LCU expansion, and we can use triangle inequality here to show that this uh, difference uh, norm of this difference always less than equal to uh, essentially. A linear combination of norms for unitaries, which are ones. And so that's one norm on the right-hand side. And uh, uh, here we can estimate that the best uh, shift you can actually do to minimize the spectral norm of the H minus uh, shifted op uh, shift operator is this delta E quantity divided by two. So the delta E quantity divided by two is we call it spectral range. Uh, this is really a difference between the largest and lowest eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian in the entire Fox space, right? So this could be a pretty large quantity, but you cannot go lower than that uh, when you do LCU according to this consideration. And the optimal shift is always, if you look at the spectrum of the Hamiltonian around the zero, uh, it's like... The, the best uh, or the lowest spectral norm you can do is by shifting um, so that the upper and lower eigenvalues are symmetrically disposed around zero. Now, this is hard limit. One norm cannot be lower than the half of the spectral range, essentially. And the only way to go around that hard limit is to change the Hamiltonian. And that's what we're going to consider next, because potentially spectral range could be pretty large. 
Now, uh, one way to actually uh, change the Hamiltonian is to use symmetry operators. Uh, it turns out like the same uh, the same way as we uh, subtracted the sh uh, sort of constant uh, or identity operator, we can subtract all the symmetry operators if that helps to reduce the norm, right? Why is this um, sort of uh, helping us? Is because again, for the propagator, all we care uh, is essentially the part that uh, well, doesn't have a symmetry. Uh, we remove symmetry, and the symmetry part is becoming a phase if we apply this propagator to a wave function that uh, is of the right symmetry, right? So then the symmetry operator will turn into a number, uh, and then that uh, phase factor will commute essentially with uh, the entire um, operator and can be uh, considered at the end, right? But that allows us to focus on the spectral range of H minus S, and uh, essentially that uh, will be less or equal than the uh, essentially one norm of the uh, LCU decomposition after removing the symmetry operator. Now, we use heuristic approach in our paper to uh, find the, essentially the symmetry operator, which is a linear combination of a uh, number of electrons as Z and uh, the quadratic forms, just to keep things uh, up to the two electron sort of uh, operator and uh, match the uh, locality of the Hamiltonian. Now, you one can potentially go even further or in introduce more symmetries, but uh, this was one of the simplest choices that we tried. And it actually, as you will see, uh, reduced the spectral range uh, and uh, the one norm quite a bit. Okay. So then another way to modify the Hamiltonian is this interaction picture approach where we try to now subtract from the Hamiltonian the part that is the, still possible to simulate or uh, still possible to sort of uh, explain shape really, right? So, and the biggest part that you can do this for is this, uh, as turns out, uh, the largest uh, two electron uh, Hamiltonian that is solvable by Hartefog method. And we saw that this uh, type of fragments, they look like this, right? And so that's what we do. Now, uh, in order to do the simulation interaction picture, our propagator becomes a Dyson series, uh, which is completely fine if you're doing some sort of a, a Taylor series-like uh, expansion of the propagator anyway. Uh, so you you just get the time dependence of the interaction uh, kind of perturbation, right, which looks like this. And the idea here is that this linear combination of unities is only needed for the difference between H and H0. So if H0 contains a lot of uh, already, uh, the big part of H, then the the one norm of uh, uh, this perturbation part is uh, considered to be small. So in reality, it is quite small. Now, Advantages, of course, reduction of one norm. Uh, disadvantage of this uh, approach is that it makes the Hamiltonian time dependent and say methods like cubitization cannot be applied uh, yet to the time dependent Hamiltonian. So that puts some restriction on the uh, this way of reducing the one norm. Okay, so we discussed how we could potentially modify the Hamiltonian. They all fall into this form where you have a Hamiltonian written as something that you want to remove from the Hamiltonian X, and then you do one norm for the rest. But we didn't yet discuss what unitaries one can use for uh, well, doing LCU decomposition, right? Now, the easiest LCU and uh, the one that was uh, used before our work uh, is really uh, taking the linear combination of Pauli products, right? Because Pauli products are unitaries by themselves. And uh, this sort of decomposition, uh, kind of people arrive to it naturally by just doing Jordan Wigner transformation. But we can do much better than that. So, essentially, what is done here is uh, forming the groups of anti commuting Pauli products. And uh, that gives you sort of this, uh, we call them reflections. Why? Do you get reflections by grouping the anti-commuting Pauli products? 
turns out you can easily check that if you uh, do group them and normalize the coefficients in that group uh, so that the sum of the squares is to one. So then the operator that you get is a reflection so that Ri squared is one. And then you can also show that by doing this grouping, you always uh, reduce the one norm. That's just uh, comes from the uh, simple algebra. Okay. So that's why uh, one way to reduce the one uh, norm is to group the Pauli products in the qubit space at least. Now in fermionic space, before you went to uh, qubit space, uh, what one can do is to do the decomposition of the Hamiltonian uh, that you need to do the one norm for uh, LCU decomposition for into this Hartifog solvable problems uh, and uh, fragments really. And there are two ways potentially one can do it is either keeping lambda matrix uh, low rank or full rank. Uh, so by low rank, I mean, it's like when it's outer product of uh, a single vector, each uh, lambda matrix. Okay, so there are these two possibilities. And then uh, no matter which you're gonna take, you can transform some of these occupation numbers that you have in the middle into reflections. And uh, the trick here is that occupation number operators, they are projectors essentially, right? So they have an idempotent uh, condition. So the eigenvalues are zeros and ones. And you can always make a reflection out of such projectors by uh, doing this essentially, right? So multiplying projector by two and subtracting one. So that allows you to have uh, operator whose eigenvalues are plus minus one. You're essentially shifting the spectrum. And so that uh, allows you to obtain essentially Hamiltonian uh, written as uh, kind of one electron and two electron reflections uh, because uh, your sort of uh, in the inner reflect, uh, reflections, uh, which is like the small r's, will be just just with the with the uh, orbital uh, rotations, right? And two electron version is like this, and so that's uh, how one can uh, do the LCU in fermionic space, and then of course you go to the uh, with Jordan Wigner to qubit space, and uh, this uh, spectral properties uh, they will stay with you. Okay, now how do these com uh, different decompositions work? Uh, which one is better? Let's see some statistics for what we did here. It's like, again, small molecules where we can uh, manipulate with Hamiltonians uh, quite easily, but uh, nothing prevents us actually to go to uh, larger systems because uh, calculating one norm is relatively straightforward. And the composition that we use uh, also uh, can be done on the large systems. Now, how do we compare different methods? We compare them with the naive approach where we do one norm uh, calculation using just a linear combination of Paulis. So that is uh, kind of very simple and uh, whatever method we use, it should be better. So what we plot here for all these molecules, we uh, consider essentially one norm of uh, various LCU methods as a y-axis uh, versus one norm of Pauli, uh, the, the most naive approach. And as you can see, there's like a, a slope uh, 45 degree and go uh, is uh, corresponding to the Pauli approach, right? And all our advanced methods, they are uh, below that diagonal line. Now, the lowest, absolutely lowest that we can obtain for uh, really small systems uh, because it requires finding the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian high, largest and lowest is this spectral range. Uh, so we cannot go lower than that. So all the methods are somewhere in between. And what we do to compare different methods is just to cal we calculate the slope uh, for well, different systems, all right? So, uh, and uh, see how that slope is uh, lower than the slope of Pauli, which is one, right? So absolutely largest is Pauli, absolutely lowest uh, is the slope for the spectral ranges, and every method is somewhere in between. Now we have <clears throat> multiple methods. Uh, in red is an anti-commuting grouping. In this uh, two blue uh, colors is uh, are essentially the low rank and full rank uh, uh, decomposition of the Hamiltonian and then uh, finding reflections. 
and uh, in black is uh, spectral range. Now there are three types of uh, Hamiltonians we consider. Uh, the first one is we don't do anything, we just apply uh, no no symmetry shift, just uh, use the, the shift of the uh, with the constant uh, or with the identity uh, operator. So this is uh, essentially it's like pristine uh, Hamiltonians. And then uh, this one is with the uh, kind of doing the shift, symmetrical shift. And the third one is an interaction picture. And even though everything scaled like where Pauli uh, one norm is one because it's a slope, right? Uh, we uh, can sort of uh, find here that uh, symmetry shift generally uh, produce 20% uh, uh, smaller one norms uh, in general compared to uh, no symmetry shift. And that is 20% uh, if we compare just the two Pauli versions. And then if we go to the interaction picture, it's uh, five times smaller uh, even at the Pauli level. Now, of course, other methods, they uh, will kind of reduce even further the one norm. And uh, this is essentially statistics. Now, there are not many kind of obvious trends. Uh, generally, kind of full rank works better than low rank and uh, anti-commuting uh, for these two cases uh, is uh, less efficient than uh, fermionic, but in interaction picture, it is more efficient than fermionic. So uh, we don't have a really a good explanation for why is this happening, but that's the that's the statistics. And uh, one can simply uh, apply all these methods for whatever system they're interested in and see which one works better because they are not that complicated to, to do. Uh, and they are all more efficient than just uh, doing a linear combination of unities with Pauli products. All right, so to summarize, we have uh, this one norm LCU, uh, lower bound, first of all, uh, that is related to the spectral range. And uh, if you can find the spectral range of your Hamiltonian, then you can see how low can you go with the uh, one norm of your LCU expansion. Then, uh, reducing uh, sort of uh, this lower bound uh, can be done by uh, changing the Hamiltonian, uh, subtracting symmetries, uh, or switching to interaction picture. Uh, various grouping techniques, uh, whether in qubit or fermionic uh, operators, uh, they further reduce uh, the one norm and uh, allow you to obtain better decompositions.